Welcome to Politics Unplugged. I'm Andrew Trujillo. It's been a rough week for President Trump when it comes to Russia. Just days after the Justice Department announced indictments against 12 Russian nationals accused of engaging in a sustained effort to hack Democrats' emails and computer networks during the 2016 election, the president met with his Russian counterpart and seemed to dispute the findings of his own country's own intelligence agencies. As they said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. Now, lawmakers back in the U.S., including members of Trump's own party, taking the president to task. U.S. Republican Senator Cory Gardner did not mention Trump by name in his statement, saying the administration should avoid normalizing relations with Russia and, quote, nothing should change as of today. Putin's Russia is not a friend to the United States. U.S. Senator Michael Bennett, a Democrat, called Trump's meeting a failure saying the president failed to hold Vladimir Putin accountable. Soon after, the president corrected his remarks, saying he misspoke. I said the word would instead of wouldn't. And the sentence should have been, and I thought it would be maybe a little bit unclear on the transcript or unclear on the actual video. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be Russia. Sort of a double negative. Now, the president also repeated that his campaign did not collude with Russia and that any meddling had no impact on the election results. And there's more. The White House confirmed Thursday that talks are underway for Vladimir Putin to visit Washington as soon as this fall. This, as the White House says, the president, quote, disagrees with Putin's offer to allow Russia to interview Americans accused of crimes by the Kremlin, an idea that seemed to intrigue him earlier in the week. Well, here to help us sort out what uh, all of this means is Professor David Goldfisher from the University of Denver's Corbell School of International Studies. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. How would you characterize this? relationship between President Trump and Vladimir Putin? The relationship, I think it was clear before, but now dramatically so, that they are essentially in complete alignment regarding uh, Europe, regarding the assault on liberal democracy that's now taking place. And so there are ripple effects to this relationship that, uh, that we're seeing everywhere. So what are the ramifications? Well, right now, the battle lines are really being drawn. On one side, there's Trump, Putin. Supporting Trump domestically is his base. And of course, the views of that base being stirred and amplified by Fox News, primarily, but other right-wing outlets. Against Trump uh, are the uh, majority, probably, in Congress, all the Democrats, a tiny handful of Republicans, but most of those Republicans, as we've been watching, are more or less cowed, fearful of their base. What's been interesting to see in the last few days, especially with Dan Coats, the director of national intelligence yesterday, is that the intelligence community is clearly arrayed against Trump. And now we've seen the first really public viewing of that break. Uh, and beyond that, the uh, whole national security establishment is not lined up with Trump, with his attack on NATO, for example. And having said all of that, what's, what's wrong with having a relationship with Russia? What's wrong with um, reaching out in a way that's never been done before? Yeah, there, I think there are two lenses through which to view that question. And what most people answer initially in response is, of course we need to seek better relations with Russia. Of course there are areas in the world, uh, in the Middle East, um, regarding the Ukraine, regarding nuclear arms control, where the U.S., even in the depths of the Cold War, was trying to pursue a better relationship with Russia. But we're in kind of a unique circumstance right now because Russia attacked the United States in order to undermine the election of the president and did so for the benefit of Donald Trump. Without confronting that, without dealing with that, it's impossible to imagine America as we know it uh, having a cooperative relationship with Russia. The November elections are coming up and it's not clear that Trump is actively trying to lead the United States in defending the country to make sure these elections are free and fair. And without some sort of deterrent threat that's loud and clear that will prevent Putin from trying to repeat what he did in the 2016 elections, we're in a shaky situation right now. So you feel as we look towards November that 
or, or even, um, I mean, well, you mentioned Dan Coates. I mean, he talked about um, even a, a cyber 9-11 as a possibility because of Russia. What are you seeing? Yeah, yeah what are you seeing from yeah. this? Uh, you know, he, he, he talks in the intelligence community in general and informed um, students of this question talk about primarily the potential cyber attack once again on the elections, but he also talks about the penetration of uh, Russia into the country's infrastructure, which, which is an even more, or, well, at least equally nightmarish threat. But the real alarm here is over the elections themselves. If the American people do not have confidence in all those congressional relations, uh, uh, races, uh, that the outcome is legitimate. It could be very chaotic following those elections. Yet there are plenty of people, Trump supporters, who who very much stand by what what he's doing, be it unorthodox. It's become notorious now that the Trump base uh, is completely loyal no matter what. And what that loyalty meant originally was supporting Trump in his denial that Russia even attacked the United States. Well, that's now become completely clear, and as you showed in that clip, Trump has himself extremely grudgingly, but is no longer really in a position to simply say Russia did not attack the United States. The, to me, frightening extreme to which that base may now be being led is that the attack was okay, mm. that the danger of a Hillary victory and all she represented, as presented to them through the lens of Trump, um, is so nightmarish that if Russia helped, Hmm. That's fine. That it's being normalized is what you're saying. If that's being normalized, it's almost like saying game over for our democracy. Well, let me ask you, we know that the, the two men sat down in a, in a private conversation. Do you think we'll ever hear what was discussed there? Do you think we'll, well ever Well, we've know? watched this brief discussion about issuing a subpoena for the one other American in the room, the translator. Mm, right. Well, that's almost certainly a non-starter. And so it's sealed. Trump knows, Putin knows, Putin obviously has discussed this with people uh, uh, close to him. There's, we have no knowledge so far of anyone uh, with whom Trump has discussed what transpired at the meeting. And we, among the other shocks of the Dan Coats interview, we saw that the head of our national intelligence had no Was idea. Was not aware. And uh, these two will be getting back together here fairly soon. Thoughts on that very quickly? It, it, we it go. looks that way. One can imagine Washington, if Putin shows up, the size of the demonstrations, the chaos that will be mm. there. Um, there's a long way between now and then, presumably, but that, that just is the latest small shock on top of the big shock of Helsinki. Okay, I see we could talk more in depth about this, but unfortunately we are out of time. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Appreciate your insight. Back in a moment.